Ever tense up at the idea of your favorite book being turned into a movie? Welcome to Ms. Mojo. And today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 10 movies that are nothing like their source material. Before we begin, we publish new content every day. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. For this list, we're looking at stories that changed drastically once Hollywood got a hold of them. And we must warn you, spoilers lay ahead. Number 10, My Sister's Keeper. I took a look at Kate's CBC. Her white blood count is very low. Jodi Pico's novel chronicles a family with two daughters, Kate, who was diagnosed with leukemia as a young child, and Anna, who was born to serve as the organ donor for her ill sister. Pico's version ends with a slight twist, where Anna is killed in a tragic accident and her kidney is used to save her older sister. This conclusion was probably seen as too somber for mainstream audiences, however, so it was reversed to make it a little more palatable. In the film, Anna survives, and Kate, the sick sister, sadly succumbs to her disease. I'll never understand why Kate had to die and we all got to live. Number nine, less than zero. You happy or sad? I'm not sad. You don't look happy. Published when he was only 21, Brent Easton Ellis's Less Than Zero depicted the life of Clay, a nihilistic college student in 1980s Los Angeles. When it was adapted for the silver screen with Andrew McCarthy portraying Clay, the filmmakers dropped the fact that the protagonist was bisexual or struggling with substance abuse. Instead, they gave him a girlfriend and best friend who were drug addicts. We'll leave you to guess which one he saves and ends up with. Ellis wasn't very happy with the end product, claiming the projects were the same only in title and that the film was largely miscast. Make me understand, Julian. I really want to understand. Number eight, Fever Pitch. I love the rest. I'm gonna win all the way. While Nick Hornby went on to write the screenplays for Wild and Brooklyn, his earlier run-ins with Hollywood weren't as successful. Fever Pitch was the writer's memoir covering his life as a fan of Arsenal Football Club, which went on to be adapted into a 1997 film starring Colin Firth. However, when the Farrelly brothers developed an American remake, they totally missed the point. So uh, when do you find out about this promotion thing? Now starring Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore, the story focused on a Boston Red Sox superfan's inability to balance his love for the game with his romantic pursuits, shaping a rom-com out of a book devoid of romance. Lindsay, will you go to opening day with me? Number seven, adaptation. To begin, to begin, how to start. When Charlie Kaufman was hired to write the script for Susan Orlean's The Orchid Thief, he slammed into an immense wall of writer's block. As a last resort, the screenwriter then crafted an exaggerated take on his own experience struggling to adapt the text, even using himself and an imaginary brother as the lead characters. Yeah, but it's easier for plants. I mean, they have no memory. Although Orlean appears in the film portrayed by Meryl Streep, Orlean herself initially rejected the movie, which had much less to do with her vision than being a one-of-a-kind exploration of the often impossible task of faithfully translating a text from page to screen. Change is not a choice. Not for a species of plant, not for me. Number six, The Born Identity. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. None of it. There are a number of glaring differences between Robert Ludlum's 1980s spy thriller and the one that hit multiplexes starring Matt Damon. One of the biggest ones? In the novel, Jason Bourne meets a well-off French Canadian named Marie, who helps him along his literal journey of self-discovery. But in the film, she's a penniless German who isn't much more than a damsel in distress. Thanks for the ride. Anytime. Additionally, where novel Marie survives the series, Phil Marie is killed off by the screenwriter, uh, rather, by an assassin in the sequel. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't think that's a decision you can make. Number five, Jurassic Park. Welcome to Jurassic Park. If you've ever picked up a copy of Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, you'll know that it's hardly the same story as Steven Spielberg's blockbuster. Several characters are totally different. The novel's Dr. Grant loves kids and dino fanboys, while his relationship with Dr. Ellie Sattler is that of a platonic mentor, rather than the romantic upgrade the pair are given in the film. Paper Grant also spends much of the novel rafting back to safety, rather than the journey depicted on screen. Meanwhile, 
Novel Hammond is eaten, Dr. Wu dies via raptor, and Ian Malcolm dies amid a haze of pain-killing morphine. But your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Number four, World War Z. You're letting people in. Every human being we save is one less only to fight. How's this for poetic license? Max Brooks's World War Z follows a United Nations employee interviewing the people left behind after a zombie apocalypse. Brad Pitt's World War Z, on the other hand, follows that same character as he takes it upon himself to try to stop the surprisingly speedy zombie takeover while it's happening. The movie version takes what was originally a speculative sci-fi tale and pushes it full throttle into horror film territory. So much so that when Brooks saw the adaptation, he said the two share only two similarities, the title and one character who appears for a whopping three minutes. Sure you want to do this? Of course I'm not. Let's go. Number three, Breakfast at Tiffany's. I love you. Audrey Hepburn became an all-time screen icon for her portrayal of Holly Golightly. But was she playing the same charismatic character from Truman Capote's novella? Both versions present a young writer who develops a fascination with the free spirit who lives downstairs. And while the novella and the film climax with Holly fleeing the country to escape her dubious past, in the film, she returns and locks lips with the young writer, lending it an archetypal Hollywood happy ending. In the book, however, the writer's sexuality is left ambiguous, and he never hears from his friend Holly again, leaving him to contemplate whatever happened to her. Number two, I, Robot. I don't know. I just need to know if you can get me into that building. We all remember the Will Smith vehicle I, Robot, which, yes, was named after the collection of short stories by Isaac Asimov. The book is something of a philosophical examination of humans, robots, and morality. But it hardly provided the basis for an action popcorner featuring hordes of murderous robots. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Really, only some of the characters' names from Asimov's stories make it into the movie, in addition to the three rules of robotics. Otherwise, they're two works that operate on completely different levels. I would prefer not to kill Dr. Calvin. Number one, The Shining. What are you doing down here? You'd think a collaboration between Stanley Kubrick and Stephen King would be perfection, right? Not so much. Kubrick, as was his way, only cared about his vision, transforming Jack Torrance from a sympathetic writer dealing with alcoholism into a crazed killer. The novel contains scenes that would have been horrifying if they'd made it into the film, including Jack's final demise in a furnace explosion. Instead, Kubrick added the creepy bear costume and here's Johnny. Here's Johnny! <laughs> King publicly denounced the movie, saying it's the only adaptation of his work that he hates, perhaps because the lawnmower man didn't even bother to adapt his story. You're a freak! Your naive idiocy makes me very angry! Do you agree with our picks? Check out these other great clips from Ms. Mojo and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.